This is the lecture on the social psychology of emotions. If there is one thing that we could say about humans is that they are all emotional creatures. Unless you suffer from some sort of psychological disorder such as extreme autism or you're a sociopath or if you've had part of your brain destroyed in an explosion, you all listening to this lecture have experienced and will continue to experience emotions such as happiness, sadness, anger, fear, embarrassment, shame, guilt, and jealousy, just to name a few of the human emotions, on a regular basis. Many of you listening right now are probably experiencing some emotions as we, as we speak. You may be happy or sad or angry because you have to listen to this lecture. Now, because of the predominance of emotions in people's lives, any science of human behavior has to contend with the emotional experiences of human beings. Social psychology is no exception in this regard. Social psychologists focus specifically on how the social world influences people's emotional experiences. But what are emotions? Defining what emotions are is actually more complicated than you might think. But a good definition of emotions is that they are short-term states of being caused by appraisals in our environment as good or bad for our welfare or for the welfare of people we care about that include the following three things. These things is physiological reactions. When we experience emotions, we experience differences in our ordinary bodily experiences. When we feel happy, we feel quite different physically than when we're not happy. When many of us are happy, we often feel lighter than we normally do. And when we're happy, we feel our muscles relax more than usual, most likely because our body is experiencing an endorphin rush that is, that is causing us to relax. These physiological reactions are mostly caused by the autonomic nervous system, and thus they are mostly uncontrollable. This is why it's often hard to hide the fact that you're happy or you're experiencing some sort of emotion. Your body gives it away. Emotions also consist of gestures that express felt emotions to others. When we experience emotions, we often do things that tell others that we are experiencing these emotions. For example, we have particular facial expressions to express felt emotions to others, which we'll talk about way more in a little bit. We also express these emotions in non-facial body language. For example, when we're sad, we often shrink away, so to speak, looking down at the ground and not making contact with other people. We also express these emotions through verbal and nonverbal gestures. When we're sad, we can express this by simply telling others, I'm sad. We could also express sadness through nonverbal vocal gestures like moans and wails. Finally, emotions also consist of linguistic labels that name the combination of physiological reactions and behavioral gestures. We learn to give specific sets of physiological changes and gestures a name. For example, we learn to give the coldness we feel and the frowning we do when we lose something sadness. And depending on the language, there may be synonyms for the same emotion. For example, we might consider happy and glad synonyms of the same emotional experience. Also, depending on the language, there might be terms to note the intensity of an emotion. For example, the term joyful tends to mean we are experiencing a great deal of happiness, and pleased tends to mean we are experiencing just a little bit of happiness. For a more specific example, let's look at the emotion of anger. Right, so when we're angry, we, most of us experience physiological changes of some regard. 
right? A lot of us increase heart rate. Some of us start sweating, especially when we're really angry. We experience a spike in blood pressure, um, which often makes us hot, feel warm, warmer than usual. Just think of the last time you felt really angry and how different you felt phys physically than you would say just you know sitting around watching TV. There are also gestures that are specific to anger, right? There are unique facial expressions that express anger to others. Again, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But there are other things that we do that express our anger to others. We hit things, we stomp the floor, right? Um, but, in, but there's also, you know, verbal and nonverbal gestures. We, right? We growl like that um, or say stuff like my boil my blood is boiling right. and then there are linguistic labels for this set of emotions right and there there's anger of course and mad which a lot of us think are synonyms but there's also pissed livid furious annoyed miffed right that kind of denote our level of anger that we're experiencing Right when we when somebody says they're livid, that most of the time that means they are incredibly angry. Um, but if they're annoyed, right, they like they're angry, but you know it's not the end of the world. To fully understand what emotions are, it is helpful to distinguish emotions from similar concepts that are often treated as synonymous with emotions. One concept is feeling. Feelings are the personal experiences of particular states of being. Feeling is a more broad term than emotion because people can be in an emotional state of being, I, I am angry, and non-emotional states of being, like hunger, thirst, tired, horny, in pain. In other words, people can feel an emotion, but people can also feel other states that are not really emotions. We don't really consider being hungry or feeling hungry an emotion or being in pain or feeling pain to be an emotion, but nevertheless, hunger, pain, or feelings. A mood is also different from emotions. Moods are diffuse emotional feelings that last over an extended period of time. Being depressed or just being in a good mood are what we would consider moods. And there are two main differences between an emotion and a mood. First, a mood is a relatively long-term state of being, while experiencing an emotion is a relatively short-lived experience. For instance, being angry only lasts a few seconds to a few hours, while being in an angry mood, so to speak, can last several days or even weeks. The second main difference between an emotion and a mood is that emotions are caused by particular objects, whereas moods are not. When, when people experience an emotion, there is something in their environment or in their head that causes the emotion, and they know that this is causing the emotion. For example, most students would experience the emotion of joy for finding out that they got an A on an exam. However, moods are emotional states that are not caused by anything in the environment. Rather, people just feel them. Being in a bad mood and not knowing why is a good example of this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are many emotions in the human emotional experience. Most social psychologists group these emotions into two types, primary emotions and secondary emotions. Primary emotions are emotions that are basic to all humans. Although there is some debate on what emotions are indeed primary, most social psychologists agree that sadness, anger, happiness, and fear are primary emotions. Social psychologists consider these emotions primary for two reasons. The first reason is because these emotions evolved to help hu early humans survive. For example, the emotions of fear and anger encourage individuals to respond quickly when they are in danger. 
Most of the primary emotions are negative, which suggests that humans are more attentive to negative stimuli in their environment, probably because negative cues usually indicate some sort of danger that impel people to respond in order to survive. Social psychologists also argue that some emotions are primary because these emotions appear in the earliest stages of human development. In other words, babies experience primary emotions. As anyone who has ever interacted with a baby knows, they seem to experience emotions such as fear and anger and sadness and happiness. Secondary emotions, on the other hand, are emotions that are either learned through socialization in connection to other primary emotions or are the combination of two or more primary emotions. There are several of these emotions, some of which include guilt, shame, embarrassment, jealousy, empathy, and sympathy. Many social psychologists argue that secondary emotions are learned through the socialization process in connection to the primary emotions. For example, people will learn to experience the emotion of guilt. Babies don't really experience guilt. And guilt is based on the primary emotion of fear. When a child commits a forbidden behavior, she initially experiences fear over being caught and punished. And over time, the child internalizes this fear. And the child learns from others that she should label this internalized fear as guilt. Secondary emotions also come about through the combination of primary emotions. For example, the combination of fear and anger often leads to the emotion of jealousy because jealousy occurs when people fear that they are about to lose something and get angry over this potential loss. Like primary emotions, most secondary emotions are negative, suggesting that emotions serve as cues to help us to respond to things in the physical and social environment that negatively affect our welfare or the welfare of the people we care about. Now, when do people experience emotions? That is, what situations, what stimuli make us feel angry, fearful, embarrassed, shameful? According to social psychologists, it depends on whether the emotions are primary or secondary. People experience primary emotions when they sense, rightly or wrongly, doesn't really matter, that something has or will seriously affect their welfare, for better or for worse. For example, people experience sadness when they have lost something or someone that is important to them, whether it be another person through death, a relationship through a breakup, or a job that they had their sights set on. On the other hand, people experience happiness when they experience something that benefits them, whether it be a new relationship, getting a good job, or receiving a high grade on a term paper. Now, what this means is that what emotions people experience often hinge on how they interpret events. What may seem bad to one person may seem good or inconsequential for another person. For example, one student getting a C in a class might feel happiness for receiving such a grade, but a more achievement-oriented student might feel sadness and or anger for receiving the exact same grade. So we have the same events, but we have different emotional reactions. What's the key here? Interpretation about what this means for one's welfare. On the other hand, there are three situations that make us experience secondary emotions. First, we experience secondary emotions when we experience the actual or perceived judgment of others. For example, when people feel that they are being positively judged by others, they feel the emotion of pride. Conversely, when people feel that they are being negatively judged by others, they feel the emotions of embarrassment or shame or guilt. Second, people experience secondary emotions by taking on the role of others during social interactions. 
For instance, many people experience sadness when they interact with a person who has also experienced sadness because during the interaction with the sad person, they put themselves in their shoes and start to vicariously experience the situations that are making that person sad. And third, people experience secondary emotions when they experience a combination of two or more primary emotions at the same time. As I said earlier, mainly secondary emotions are the combination of two or more primary emotions. For example, jealousy is the combination of fear and anger. Now I want to change gears a bit and talk about a popular and much researched topic in the social psychology of emotions and that involves the universality of emotional expressions in our faces. People often recognize when others are experiencing a particular emotion. For instance, if a person is really angry, other people can usually tell. People can tell when other people are experiencing some emotions because many emotions have particular types of facial movements that demonstrate to others that a person is experiencing the emotion. For a while, many social scientists believe that the way people expressed emotions depended on the culture or society in which they were raised. These scientists believed a person born and raised in one culture would display anger or happiness differently than a person born and raised in another culture. Later on, however, there were social psychologists, particularly the science, social scientist Paul Ekman, who challenged this idea and argued that the facial expression of some emotions, especially the primary emotions, was universal amongst the human species. In other words, a person in one culture expresses anger in the same way as another person in a vastly different culture does, at least in their face. And Paul Ekman found that there are seven emotions that almost everyone can recognize despite the culture one is raised in. Happiness, fear, anger, sadness, disgust, surprise, and contempt. And as you can see from this list, many if not all of these emotions are considered primary emotions. And the universality of primary emotional expression supports Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory of emotion. Evolutionary theorists, including Charles Darwin, believe that emotional expressions evolve because these expressions and being able to recognize these expressions helped early humans survive and reproduce. For example, being able to express and to recognize someone is angry helped people avoid this angry person. And this helped people survive because an angry person can lash down if provoked, potentially hurting and killing another. Social psychologists have identified the specific facial movements that are associated with each of the seven universally expressed emotions. And let's look at the specific facial movements of each of these emotions, which, by the way, are very hard to fake, which is why actors, good ones anyway, get paid what they do. Now this picture here, of course, is a person experiencing anger. Anger is shown in many parts of the face, but the eyes and mouth are important. First, the eyes. When a person is angry, their eyebrows are drawn down and together, while at the same time, the eyes are opened wide. This is the glare that you often get when someone is angry. As for the mouth, the jaw becomes clenched very hard when a person is angry. Now, when their mouth is closed, this causes the lips to become tensed and pressed tightly as you see here, but with the mouth open, this results in a rectangular or square-shaped mouth that bears clenched teeth. This expression is disgust. Disgust is shown in lots of parts of the face, but the nose and lips are the key for recognizing disgust. The eyelids tense up during disgust, as you see here. It's almost, she looks like she's almost squinting. Also, the upper lip is raised as high as it will go, and the lower lip is also raised, making it protrude slightly. 
The outside part of the nostrils is raised and wrinkles appear on the sides of the bridge of the nose. Sorry, you can't see it because of the low res picture. These are the best I could find. No surprise, but this is surprise. With surprise, the eyebrows are raised high, but they are but they are not drawn inward. Again, with many people, you can tell this because the brow will not furrow very much, if at all, with surprise, but it will with anger. Also, the lower eyelids are not drawn up, making the eyes look very big, like as wide open as possible. As to the mouth, the jaw usually drops wide without the lips drawing back, sort of a, an agate mouth. This is fear. In the fear expression, the eyebrows are drawn up high and inward, which causes the edges of the eyebrows to go up. You can also see this sometimes in people's brows. The brow will become quite wrinkled in fear. Also, the lower eyelids are drawn upward. And as to the mouth, the lips are drawn back towards the ears. Most of the time, the jaw, jaw is dropped slightly, making a mouth opening. This is sadness. With sadness, the corners of the mouth are pulled down. This often causes a frown with the mouth closed and a whale-like expression with the mouth open. Both the upper and lower eyelids are drooped and the inner corner of the eyebrows are turned upward, making the eyebrows appear like a straight diagonal line. This is happiness. We recognize happiness by the smile or by the curling of the outward, outer lips upward. However, if you really want to know if a person is experiencing happiness, the eyes are the key. As we all know, people smile all the time to be polite or for pictures or to try to hide the emotions that they're really feeling. But here are two people, or here are two pictures of the same person smiling. But in one picture, she is just smiling, while in the other, she is smiling because she is genuinely happy. And you can probably tell immediately which one, where she's smiling, where she's truly happy. When a person is truly happy, the muscles surrounding the orbits of the eyes contract. And you can see it right here. In the picture on the right, the woman's eyebrows have moved down slightly, her cheeks are higher, and the contours of her cheeks have changed. All of this action is due to the outer part of the muscle that orbits the eye, called the orbicularis oculi. It is estimated that only about 10% of the human population has any sort of voluntary control over these muscles. So expressing actual happiness is very hard to fake. This is why people who smile a lot also get a lot of crow's feet, wrinkles. Contempt is the last universal emotional expression, and it was the one that was discovered last. The basic signal for this emotion in the face is the lip corner that is tightened and raised on only one side of the face, as you can see from this contemptuous gentleman here. There is almost a blank stare with no movement in the eyebrows, sort of looking at you like you're stupid. And there is much empirical support for the universality of emotional expression. First, people from a variety of nations and cultures recognize the expressions of certain emotions. For example, social psychologists have shown the same and similar pictures that we just looked at to people who were born and raised in a variety of different cultures and asked them to identify the emotions being expressed. For example, as you can see from this chart, a large majority of people in all of these cultures recognize the emotional expressions of sadness, happiness, disgust, fear, surprise, and anger. Another piece of evidence for the universality 
of emotional expression comes from studies of the congenitally blind or people who were born blind. People who are born blind express sadness, happiness, fear, and other emotions in their faces in the exact same ways sighted people do. And this supports the universality of emotional expression because the congenitally blind could not express these emotions in these particular ways through observing others. Some scientists critique the work of the universality of emotional expression, saying that the findings might simply be due to the fact that most people in countries have been exposed to Western culture through things like television, movies, the internet. And because of exposure to Western culture, these emotional expressions might not be universal. Rather, people in non-Western cultures may have developed the ability to recognize Western emotional expressions and may not themselves express emotions in these ways. So to deal with this critique, Paul Ekman, who I mentioned earlier, sought out a group of people that had almost no exposure to Western culture. And he found them in the foray of New Guinea. The foray were a group of natives that lived in the rainforest of New Guinea and had no exposure to TV or print media or in the internet really didn't exist at the time from the West. Ekman showed the same pictures we just saw to the foray and asked them to identify the emotion. They were correct around 80-90% of the time. In another part of the study, Ekman asked the foray to act out emotional scenarios. For example, he asked them to act like they would if their child had died, or if they were angry and about to get into a fight, and how they would react to the birth of a child. And he took pictures of them. And then he came back to the United States and showed these pictures of the foray acting out these emotional scenarios to American college students. And the students overwhelmingly were able to identify most of the emotions expressed by the foray. And this set of studies provided strong evidence that the recognition of the expression of certain emotions isn't due to a particular cultural exposure, but rather because the expressions of emotions and their recognition is universal among the human species. Now, while the expression and recognition of certain emotions is universal, cultures and societies do vary tremendously on what we call emotional display rules. Emotional display rules are culturally determined rules about which emotions are appropriate to display in a particular context and which emotions people of different statuses and roles are expected to display. And emotional display rules require modifying facial expressions of emotions in one of four ways. First, display rules may require greater intensity of the expression of emotions in certain cases. In many cultures, for example, people are sp supposed to express sadness in an extreme manner when a death has occurred. Second, display rules may require less intensity in the expression of an emotion. For example, in Japan, there is the emotional display rule that women should not display a big smile, which is usually caused by experiencing happiness. This is why you often see Japanese women cover their mouths when they laugh. Third, display rules may require the complete neutralization of an emotional expression. For instance, in the U.S., there are norms of masculinity that teach men that they are not supposed to express extreme sadness. Men don't cry, as they say. Finally, display rules may require the masking of one emotion with a different one. For instance, in the U.S., people attending a funeral are supposed to express sadness even if they are feeling another emotion, like when a person goes to the funeral of someone he didn't like. R.I.P. Bozo. Now, while most people recognize full expressions of single emotions, it is actually quite rare in life when people express emotions fully. This is especially the case with negative emotions, which people often don't want to fully express because they don't want to make others feel uncomfortable in an interaction. 
Now, one thing that makes recognizing the emotions that other people experience difficult is the fact that people often experience more than one emotion at the same time. Experience more than one emotion at the same time causes what social psychologists call effect blends, which is the presence of two or more emotions in the face at the same time. Here are a couple of examples of effect blends. Person on the left here is both disgusted and angry. You can tell disgust through the nose and the lips, anger, especially through the eyes and the eyebrows. And the person on the right is both surprised and happy. Her lips are starting to curl up a little bit and her eyes are very wide, her eyebrows are very high, which indicates surprise. So it's like happy surprise. And to see, let's look, to see effect blends really well, let's look at the most famous effect blend I think has ever been captured on a photograph. Now, some of you may recognize this, some of you may not, but this is the upper part of the face of the person I want to show you. Now, based just on this part of the face, you would, you, you would assume that this person is angry. His, Eyebrows are down, the eyes are wide. He's very angry. But what if I just showed you the bottom of the person's face? The lips are going way back, almost in a motion, right? That's fear. Right? So this person is experiencing... So this person is experiencing anger and fear. And this face belongs to Detective Laville, the law enforcement officer who was escort escorting Lee Harvey Oswald when he was assassinated by Jack Ruby. He shows both fear and anger in his face. As you might imagine, like he just had a gun go off on him, like literally three feet away from him. But Jack Ruby is making his job of escorting Lee Harvey Oswald quite difficult. So he's angry. So his eyebrows are pulled down and together, pressing against his raised upper eyelids, protruding, producing the angry glare, right? But his mouth shows fear. His lips are stretched back toward his ears, right? And again, this all makes sense. A gun just went off literally three feet from him, right? If that, right? So any, I don't care how hardened and grizzled you are, that's going to cause you to tense up with fear a little bit. But he's also quite angry because again, Jack Ruby is making him look bad at his job. Another thing that makes reading emotional expressions hard in everyday life is that people often don't express their emotions fully. People try not to express their emotions fully for a variety of reasons. A student doesn't want to let her professor know that she's really pissed over her grade, or a guy doesn't want to let others know how sad he is over breaking up with his girlfriend, or a high-rise construction worker doesn't want to show his fear lest he re lose the respect of his coworkers. Even though people try to inhibit the full expression of emotions, many social psychologists argue that inhibiting the emotion that one is experiencing is quite difficult to do to a full extent anyway. That is, even when people try their best to inhibit an emotion, telltale signs in the face nevertheless show up. When people try to inhibit the expression of the emotions that they are experiencing, micro-expressions, slight expressions, or partial expressions of emotions often occur. A micro expression is an expression of an emotion that is incredibly short in duration, typically about one fifth of a second or less. Because of their short duration, micro expressions make it very difficult for people to recognize the emotion that, other, that another is experiencing, simply because you didn't have time to see it. Yes, it is very easy to look at a static picture of someone and determine what emotion they're experiencing. 
but if they only show that emotion for a fifth of a second and you have your head turned, you may not see it. And even if you are looking at them, you might have to see it because it happens so fast. A slight expression is where muscles that create emotion, emotional expressions are not contracted very much. The lack of contracting of the muscles in the face in slight expressions makes it difficult for others to know what emotions a person is experiencing. Again, the pictures that we looked at earlier are people in full contraction, showing the emotion fully, right? But we do have a little control where we, you know, in how much we can contract our faces when experiencing emotion, we can kind of hold it back. And again, that makes it hard for others to know sometimes that we are experiencing a particular emotion. And a partial expression is where an emotion is evident in just one area of the face. Partial expressions make it difficult for people to recognize the emotion that another is experiencing because they might be paying attention to the part of the face that is actually expressing the emotion, right? Right. When we, we want to think somebody's happy, somebody wants to wants us to think that they're very happy, so they smile, right? But and we look at the smile and think, okay, well, they're happy, but we don't really look at the eyes. And like I said before, the eyes are what give it away. And what makes things even more difficult is that these three types of expressions often overlap. Partial expressions are also often slight. Micro expressions can also be partial and slight and so on and so forth. And so, yes, when we look at pictures, we definitely can tell when people are in full you know, expression of an emotion. We can tell what they are. But in our normal everyday life, right, it's, it's harder than it seems. Again, not because we don't recognize it in its full, but because of things like micro expressions and slight expressions, often caused by emotional display rules. Right? We try to hide our emotions or we try to show emotions that we aren't actually experiencing. Now let's change gears a bit and discuss the association between physiological arousal and emotional experience. Emotional experiences are associated with some sort of physiological or bodily arousal. When people experience fear, their hearts start beating quickly, they start sweating. When people experience sadness, they often feel cold. When people experience anger, they experience increased heart rate, tensed up muscles. And social psychologists have investigated and continue to debate the role physiological arousal plays in emotional experiences. While the relationship may seem like a simple and direct one, it may be anything but that. And this debate concerning the role of physiological arousal and emotional experience falls into three camps. Uh, James Lang theory, cognitive labeling theory, and cognitive appraisal theory. Now the first theory regarding the association between physiological arousal and emotional experiences is the James Lang theory. It's called that because it was named after the two psychologists who came up with it independently from one another, William James and Carl Lang. According to the James Lang theory, there is a specific unique set of physiological symptoms associated with each specific emotion. For example, there is a specific and unique set of physiological symptoms for anger, a set of specific and unique physiological symptoms for fear, and so forth. According to the theory, the human autonomic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that handles involuntary functions such as heart rate and breathing, automatically and unconsciously causes these specific physiological arousals in response to outward stimuli. People then interpret the physiological arousal as evidence that they are experiencing a particular emotion. In short, the James Lang theory argues that there is a unique and specific set of physiological symptoms for each emotion, 
and that people interpret these physiological symptoms as signs that they are experiencing a particular emotion. So it kind of goes like this. Some event happens in the world to a person. That causes them to experience a specific physiological arousal. And then they interpret that arousal for what that means, for what emotion that they should be experiencing. And then they experience the emotion. Be for a more concrete example, let's say a person is walking out in the woods and they see a bear, right? That's going to immediately cause one's body, without even thinking about it, to, to um, the heart rate starts going way up, starts sweating immediately, maybe even pee your pants a little bit. And then the person asks themselves unconsciously, but nevertheless, what do these physiological changes mean? And they mean, I'm scared, right? As they probably should be if they encountered a grizzly bear on a walk in the woods. The second theory regarding the link between physiological arousal and emotional experiences is cognitive labeling theory. According to cognitive labeling theory, emotional experience is a result of a two-step process. That's why it's also called the two-factor theory of emotion. The first step is that people experience some sort of physiological arousal. And the second step is that people then seek an appropriate explanation for the arousal to figure out what emotion they are experiencing. For this last step, people often look around at their immediate environments to figure out what is causing them to experience physiological arousal so they can interpret why they are experiencing said arousal. Unlike the James Lang theory, cognitive labeling theory argues that physiological arousal is often ambiguous and can be interpreted in a variety of ways. That is, cognitive labeling theory argues there is not a specific and unique set of physiological symptoms for every emotion. Rather, the same physiological symptoms are present for a variety of different emotions and people look around to their immediate environment to determine what is causing the arousal and thus interpret the emotion that they are feeling. To test cognitive labeling theory, some social psychologists did an experiment where they made people experience some sort of ambiguous physiological arousal and then put them in different types of situations. The researchers caused the physiological arousal by shooting the participants up with epinephrine, which causes increased heartbeat and sweating. The participants were told they were being given a vitamin shot that would not cause physiological arousal. The experimenters did this because they wanted to see if the participants would interpret these physiological symptoms differently than if they were in different situations. And after unknowingly being injected with epinephrine, the participants were each put in a room with an actor hired by the experimenters. In one condition, the actor acted happy and euphoric, goofing off and playing around with things in the room. In another condition, the actor acted angry, throwing things around in a huff and angrily mocking the experimenters. The experimenters put the participants in one of these conditions to see if they would interpret their physiological arousal based on the particular context. The results were quite interesting and supported cognitive labeling theory. The participants who were put in the room around the happy actor reported feeling happy, while those put in the room around the angry actor reported feeling angry. So the same physiological arousal yet different emotional experiences, depending on the context. Cognitive labeling theory has also been supported by the findings of the scary bridge experiments. In these experiments, the experimenters had men cross an unsafe looking bridge 
like the one you see here, or a safe looking bridge. They had some participants walk over a scary looking bridge because they wanted the participants to experience fear and the associated physiological arousal one experiences when experiencing fear. Now, why did they do this? Well, the researchers did this because they wanted to see if they could get some participants to interpret that physiological arousal caused by these feelings of fear and make them interpret it as sexual arousal. And to do this, the experimenters had a female interviewer go up to the men after they had crossed the bridge and conduct an interview. And after the interview was over, the female interviewer gave the participants her personal phone number to call if they had any more questions about the research. The experimenters used whether the participants called the female interviewer or not as a measure of sexual attraction toward the interviewer, since they reasoned that only men who felt sexually attracted to the female interviewer would call, perhaps, you know, asking for a date. The results of these experiments supported the kind of labeling theory of emotion. As you can see from this chart, 50% of the men who crossed the scary bridge called the female interviewer, while only 13% of the men who crossed the safe bridge called the female interviewer. And in another part of the experiment, the researchers had the female interviewer actually approach the in and interview the men while they were still on the scary bridge. So they experienced the height of fear, right? And the experimenters hypothesized that even more men would call the female interviewer in this situation, since the fear would be more intense and thus perhaps the sexual attraction would be more intense. And as you can see here, 70% of the men who were interviewed while on the bridge called the female interviewer, while only 26% of the men who were interviewed after crossing the bridge and resting for a while called the female interviewer. And again, the results of these experiment, experiments support the kind of labeling theory of emotions. The experimenters in, induced fear in the participants as well as, and this induced the physiological arousal that comes with experiencing fear. Yet the results of the experiment seem to indicate that men can be made to interpret the physiological arousal caused by fear as sexual arousal if they change the context, i.e. put another person in that context. Like the cognitive labeling theory of emotions suggests, this experiment provides evidence that physiological arousal can be ambiguous and can be interpreted in a variety of ways depending on the situation. So to think about this more formally, kind of labeling theory goes like this. We experience some physiological arousal for whatever reason. Our heart rate goes up or whatever. Right. According to kind of labeling theory, we then scan our environment for factors causing the arousal. What's making my heart rate go up so fast? What's making me sweat? and we interpret the arousal based on these factors. And then we determine what emotion we experience. And oh, uh, my heart rate is going up because I'm scared. Well, no, my heart rate is going up because there's a beautiful woman in front of me. Or more concrete examples, right? Person's experiencing high heart rate, they're sweating. They ask themselves, again, unconsciously, we're not putting, we're not asking ourselves this directly. And they see a bear. Like, oh, well, of course, that high heart rate sweating is because I'm scared. Well, let's say that we change the context. We're experiencing high heart rate sweating again. We ask ourselves, what's causing me to experience these symptoms? A beautiful lady, right? And then we say, well, I, I have this high heart rate. I'm sweating because I'm very happy that this beautiful lady is with me.
The third theory regarding the link between physiological arousal and emotional experience is cognitive appraisal theory. Now, according to both the James Lang theory and, the, and cognitive labeling theory, physiological arousal always precedes the experience of an emotion. But according to cognitive appraisal theory, this is not the case. According to this theory, people experience emotions by interpreting the events around them as either positive, negative, or neutral for themselves or for their significant others. And these interpretations of events then cause people to experience a particular emotion, which in turn leads to a physiological arousal. So, for example, if a person experienced a death of a loved one, she would interpret this event as negative or bad for herself, feel the emotion of sadness, and then experience the physiological changes we often associate with sadness. So, to sort of put this formally, there is an event that happens. And then the person says to themselves, you know, what does this event mean for me or for my loved ones? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it neutral? And then they experience the emotion. If it's bad for them, they experience sadness, anger, something like that. If it's good for them, they experience happiness. And then people will experience the physiological changes. So people first get sad and then ex get the physiological changes, not experience the physiological changes and then interpret it as sadness. Some more concrete examples here. So let's say a person's walking in the woods and sees a bear. We know that grizzly bears eat people. You would then experience the emotion of fear and then experience the physiological changes associated with being afraid, like pounding heart rate, immediate sweating, pissing pants. Or you see a bear at the zoo. It's a bear at a zoo, that, and you say to yourself, that's a bear at a zoo that can't hurt me. So you don't really feel anything. You feel sort of neutral about it. Thus, no physiological response whatsoever. Now, most people experience emotions almost every day of their lives. And in many contexts and situations, people feel comfortable expressing these emotions. For example, people usually don't mind expressing happiness to their mothers over a marriage proposal. People usually don't mind expressing sadness to, the, to a spouse over the death of a child. And most people usually don't mind expressing anger to a person who has physically hurt them. However, there are many contexts and situations in everyday life where people feel it necessary to inhibit the expression of the emotions they are experiencing or to feel another emotion altogether. In these cases, people perform what social psychologists call emotion management, which is any attempt to change the type, intensity, quality, and or expression of emotions. Social psychologists have conducted numerous studies and investigations on how and why people manage the emotions they experience. There are two major reasons people engage in emotion management. The first reason is to prevent themselves or others from experiencing or expressing negative emotions and or to help themselves or others experience or express positive emotions. It is a common assumption amongst social psychologists that in general people want to experience positive emotions as much as possible and avoid experiencing negative emotions as much as possible. Because people want to experience positive emotions and avoid negative ones, they will often engage in emotion management to lessen the experience of negative emotions and or to increase the experience of positive emotions. For example, 
When many people experience negative emotions like sadness or anger, they try to do pleasant things to take their minds off the objects or situations that have made them sad or angry. Like go watch a movie, uh, go play video games, something like that. If you've ever done something like this, you've ever done something to take your mind off something that's been making you feel angry or sad, you have done emotion management. Furthermore, people often want others in their lives to not experience negative emotions and to experience positive emotions. In other words, people not only manage their emotions, but other people's emotions as well. For instance, if you have ever given somebody a compliment to help cheer them up because they seem sad, you have at least tried to manage the emotions of others. The second reason people engage in emotion management is to express or feel the emotions required by the feeling rules of the situation. Feeling rules are social rules that dictate what emotions people should feel and express in certain situations in a particular society. For many situations people find themselves in in life, there are feeling rules about what emotions people should feel or at least express. For instance, a feeling rule for a wedding in America is to feel and express happiness, while a feeling rule for a funeral in America is to feel and express sadness. Sometimes, however, people don't actually experience the emotions that feeling rules say they should experience. A person may, for example, experience sadness at a wedding because he is seeing the love of his life get married to another man. Or a person may experience happiness at a funeral because she stands to inherit millions of dollars from the person in the coffin. When people's private emotions don't line up with the feeling rules of the situation, they will often engage in emotion management. This is mostly because others view people who are violating the feeling rules of a situation as sick or abnormal or deviant or crazy. For instance, most people would look at a person sobbing uncontrollably at a wedding and hollering, woe is me, as somebody who probably needs some psychiatric help. Now, there are two major strategies of emotion management, surface acting and deep acting. Surface acting is where people change only their emotional expression without trying to change the emotions they are actually feeling. With surface acting, people still feel one emotion while expressing another. A good example of surface acting would be when a student feels angry at a professor for the grade he received on his paper, but tries to mask the anger by smiling at the professor. The cultural aphorism, laughing on the outside, crying on the inside, captures the idea of surface acting. On the other hand, deep acting is when people try to change the actual emotions that they are feeling. The main difference between surface acting and deep acting is that with deep acting, people actually are trying to experience another emotion altogether. Whereas with surface acting, they only try to express a different emotion than the one that they're actually feeling. A good example of deep acting is when a person, quote unquote, thinks happy thoughts when she experiences anger over her friend saying something quite mean to her to help her not experience anger, but to experience happiness. There is also a temporal or time dimension to emotion management. People perform emotion management to manage the emotions they expect to experience in the future, to manage the emotions they are currently experiencing, and the emotions caused by past experiences. To capture this temporal dimension, social psychologists distinguish between preparatory, in situ, and retrospective emotion management. Preparatory emotion management refers to the use of emotion management strategies in an effort to increase the likelihood of achieving or avoiding particular emotions at some future time. In other words, preparatory emotion management refers to people planning their lives so as to avoid experiencing negative emotions and or to achieve the experience of positive emotions. For instance, a person might avoid going down certain streets and 
walking into certain neighborhoods at night to avoid experiencing intense fear. Or a person might decide not to go to a party that he knows that his ex-boyfriend is going to be at to avoid experiencing the sadness he thinks he would experience by seeing this person. In situ emotion management refers to the use of strategies to manage emotions that accord, occur during the course of social interactions. It is impossible to anticipate all the negative emotions one will experience during one's day-to-day -day life, and thus people have to manage their negative emotions the moment they occur. If they didn't, it could escalate a bad situation into something even more bad. For instance, say a person is at work and all of a sudden, without any warning, his boss walks in and begins to reprimand him in front of his fellow employees for a minor error he made the day before. This would cause anybody to experience negative emotions, and if this person were to express these emotions to his boss, he might risk losing his job. Thus, he has to find a way to manage his emotions then and there, like thinking happy thoughts in order to drown out what his boss is saying to him. Retrospective emotion management refers to emotion management strategies that deal with the emotions caused by past experiences. Often people remember experiences that cause them to feel negative emotions. When this happens, people often perform emotion management strategies that try to cope with these emotions. For instance, watching a movie about a bad romantic breakup might cause one person to remember a bad breakup she experienced, which in turn might cause her to feel sadness, anger, and other negative emotions. To cope with these emotions, the person might engage in a variety of strategies people use to manage emotions, like going on a long run, or watching a funny movie, or expressing one's emotions to one's best friend. One interesting thing about emotion management is that it is a necessary part of many jobs and occupations in contemporary society. This is called emotional labor. In many, if not most jobs and occupations in contemporary society, people have to manage their emotions in order to do their jobs effectively and well. For example, I as a professor have to manage my emotions in my occupation. I have to be nice, cordial, and calm with all my students. Thus, I have to hold back any anger I might experience um, from a person complaining about an A minus. In some jobs and occupations, employees are explicitly taught how to manage emotions while at work. For example, bill collectors are taught during their initial training to sound angry towards debtors in order to create fear in debtors so that they'll pay up. Flight attendants go through extensive training on how to manage their anger toward rude passengers and their fear when there is a problem with the aircraft. During their training, clinical psychologists are taught ways to match their emotions when people tell them uh, dark and disturbing things. And even professional wrestlers learn during their training how to properly express agony on the wrestling mat in order to sell the pain that they're in, supposedly in, to their audiences. And in most jobs and occupations, employees are not taught how to manage emotions while at work. In these cases, employees have to come up with their own strategies for managing emotions. For example, some new employees model experienced employees' emotion management strategies. Right? They look at what their coworkers are doing who have been there for a while, and they do what they do. Employees also come up with their own emotion management strategies to manage emotions. Employees do this all the time, especially when there's no formal training on emotion management. To deal with a cranky and rude customer, for example, one waitress might use thinking happy thoughts to herself to take her mind away from the rude customer, while another waitress might choose to vent her anger caused by the rude customer to other waitresses or the cooking staff. Some social psychologists are interested in investigating and studying emotional labor because they're interested in seeing if there are any negative consequences for people 
for having to manage their emotions at work. In fact, the study of emotional labor began because social psychologists wanted to see how people's emotional lives were influenced by living in and working in modern, modern capitalist societies. There are several negative consequences for people for engaging in emotional labor. Two of the most significant consequences, though, are emotional estrangement and emotional burnout. Emotional estrangement is the inability for people to tell which of their emotions are real and which are fake. That is, emotional estrangement occurs when people can't tell if they are feeling an emotion because of personal reasons or if they are experiencing an emotion because it is an emotion that they are sp supposed to feel uh, at work. People who have jobs and occupations where they have to manage their emotions often talk about how they feel like they don't know if the emotions they experience are real or not. Not knowing how to interpret one's own emotions can have a lot of negative outcomes in people's lives, especially with their personal relationships. For example, a bill collector might come home and be angry at his wife, but is this because something she's actually done or some side effect, so to speak, of having to act angry at work all the time? Another negative consequence of engaging in emotional labor is emotional burnout. Emotional burnout occurs when employees no longer have the cognitive energy or capacity to manage all the negative emotions produced by their jobs or occupations. Jobs and occupations where employees have to do a great deal of emotion work often don't last long in these jobs and occupations because of emotion, emotional burnout. In other words, the more negative emotions one has to manage at one's job, the higher employee turnover is. One of the occupations with the highest turnover rate is the domestic violence shelter employee and counselor or professional. Working with victims of domestic violence can cause counselors to, and other employees of domestic violence shelters to experience a great deal of negative emotions. And the constant experience of these emotions often leads these professionals to experience emotional burnout and, because of this, stay in the profession for a relatively short period of time. Okay, so that's it for the social psychology of emotions. See you next time.